Hello everyone to the advanced deep learning lecture. Um, in the recent lectures we've talked about generative models and um, very recently we've talked about neural rendering. Um, one of the things we already discussed in the context of neural rendering is like this these hybrid neural network architectures where you have some elements being transferred to 3D. And this is a thing I wanted to chat about today, um, specifically how to do deep learning in uh, higher dimensions, right? So obviously there's all kind of data signals, right? Um, mainly in computer vision, we often look at 2D signals like images, possibly 3D on videos. Um, but most of the times we are looking at 2D conf operators and the reason why they work so well is because you can apply them on images and then they extract these features that you can then accumulate in order to get good um, classification results. Now, there's of course many other things. Um, one of them I mentioned last time, we already had the, the discussions about neural rendering, um, but there's of course many more. So if you're thinking about the 1D domain, we have audio and speech. Um, we have images, we mentioned that, but in 1D we also have things like point clouds. When you're thinking about self-driving cars, these have LiDAR scanners and with these LiDAR scanners, they capture point clouds and these point clouds can um, be used also in, in terms of map the environment and then you want to do some sort of semantic scene understanding of them. Um, the reason why points are actually um, 1D is because every point in this case would have three dimensions and then you just stack them together to, to a linear vector, right? So it's a 1D conf you could in theory apply. I'm not arguing that a conf in this case is a good operator, um, but you could of course uh, run a 1D convolution on that. Um, for audio and speech it's very clear, right? We have like samples um, for every audio signal that is uh, being generated, like, I don't know, something like 16 bit or so uh, audio signals, right? Um, it uh, depends a little bit um, on the frequency there. Um, I think there's something between 16,000 and 32,000 is a standard thing what um, people store. Um, and that is something you can do with a 1D con, for instance, right? Um, with 3D convolutions, um, we know we have videos, right? And we also have seen what I mentioned, the neural rendering parts where you can transform thing to a voxel grid and then do some 3D operators um, on 3D features. And you can have things like 3D ResNets um, uh, and all the things you have seen in 2D, you can basically directly transfer to, to voxel grids. And um, there's also things in 4D. Um, in principle, there's things like fluid simulation, dynamic, um, dynamic videos, basically. So if you have a, a volume, right, you have a 3D environment and then you have anything that is moving over time, in principle, that would be a 4D continent. So in the literature, of course, um, we have seen mostly 2D confs, right? That's just, you know, what's very popular. And um, there has been a lot of research recently on 3D confs, and that's something uh, I want to talk a little bit about more today. Um, 4D confs, not too much, but there are a few works, and there are a few works around. Um, how does it work in higher dimensions? Well, if you're looking at, uh, at the convolutions, right? I mean, uh, all we're doing here is basically, we're having here uh, our, uh, we're having here our, our, our data, right? Uh, so we have uh, an input, for instance, and then we have here our kernel, and then we can simply do um, the sliding of the kernel here in 1D, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, and we slide this kernel and, you know, this kernel will be invariant to where it's being applied. Um, and what we're doing is we're learning the weights um, of this kernel. Um, so there's not a lot of surprises going on here in 1D. Um, I'm sure you, you you can figure out how to implement this. It's not so, so difficult. Um, one of the very popular works I mentioned already in the context of um, autoregressive methods uh, was WaveNet. Uh, and WaveNet is basically, um, they use 1D convolutions. Um, and they have this autoregressive architecture. So, you know, they, they sample literally every audio sample, right? Uh, and then they have convolutions over that one. Um, this is a paper that was actually done in 2016 um, uh, by Aaron Um It's a pretty cool paper because it was one of the first ones that showed um, that you can do um, things like autoregressive models on a very large number of samples, right? Um, like, if you, again, if you're thinking about like thousands of samples per second and you have relatively long sequences, um, there's a lot of samples going on. So autoregressive models tend to work relatively well on these uh, uh, dependencies. Um, in practice, how WaveNet works is we're gonna have some sort of input here, right? Um, we're gonna have a bunch of hidden layers here. And what you're doing is you, you're literally uh, generating sample by sample, as you can see here, right? So it's like sample by sample is generated 
and every sample that is being generated here is going to be one forward pass um, in our in our network. So you can already imagine it's it's uh, well it's pretty slow, right? You have to um, I think they had I don't know like like ninety minutes or something like this for a few seconds of video or so. Uh, sorry, for a few seconds of audio. Um, uh, there's now versions that do this faster. There's parallel versions of WaveNet, um, how to do the evaluation, how to cache this efficiently at uh, runtime. It's also relatively slow to train, um, but there's, there's better versions right now that can do this faster. But in principle, this idea of you know running 1D confs on, on the audio signal um, and then having an autoregressive model, basically modeling the probabilities and predicting sample by sample by sample um, in the output stream um, is a pretty, pretty good idea. And WaveNet actually has made a lot of impact um, like variations of that are basically in the Google Assistant. It's, it's not the original paper anymore. There are some variations um, that you can see now on the Android phone, right? So text-to-speech systems would use architectures like that today. Um, again, there are some combinations of that, of course. Um, it's not exactly that anymore. They got it also a lot faster, which was very important. Um, and But the quality is actually pretty decent. So you can have a look at it and can see what WaveNet is, uh, is generating. Okay, so this is something that people have been doing in, in 1D. The reason why I'm mentioning it is, um, you know, often when you want to do something like, I don't know, you want to train a network um, that uh, generates some audio signal to a video. So you, you have to look at generative models basically for this. So when you uh, want to do speech to text, right, you would do a 1D conf net on the audio samples um, and then eventually uh, going to get some some features out of it. The deep speech is a very popular network you could look at here for feature extractions and audios. Um, yeah, that's something that is um, also encouraging. I think um, it might be interesting for you to, to look at. Um, one of the things we do a lot actually in my group is we look at a lot of uh, things in 3D, like 3D uh, shape or scene classification. Um, the idea is basically you have something like a Kinect scan or you have a LiDAR scan in a self-driving car. Um, you're going to have a bunch of 3D reconstructions here. Um, the idea is you're taking these 3D meshes. The meshes are a polygon soup of triangles and faces, like uh, faces, right? Um, and these ones you can then convert into a voxel grid. So this is the naive implementation here that you say, oh, I'm going to go and mark every voxel either as being occupied or empty. And then you can do some 3D cons over that one. Um, I will probably motivate this a little bit more, why 3D works so well. Um, and the reason is why we have 2D networks that are so big is because you have to learn the, the viewpoint invariant. So in other words, if I'm taking an image of a car and then I take another image of a car from a different viewpoint, right? the 2D pixel values will change rapidly because my camera viewpoint changed. But I want to train a network that gives me the same results. Right? I want to get the same features and the same class vector at the end of the day. Now in 3D you don't have that and one of the advantages in 3D is then you don't need so much training data. Um, which is pretty interesting, right? So obviously um, we need a lot more memory because suddenly we have 3D cons. Um, but um, yeah, we don't need so much uh, data anymore. You know, the training times are much lower, which is interesting. Um, I'll talk about this one in a little bit more. Um, anyway, but the, the first thing we want to do in this case, we want to take these 3D reconstructions of shapes and want to do 3D classification. So in this case, you have one model as input, right? And you're going to get a class label as output. Um, these are, of course, toy tasks in this case, right? You, you, you have to segment out the object first um, and, and figure out this is a bathtub then. Um, in practice, you can do tasks like 3D semantic segmentation, right? Um, here we have um, an example from ScanNet that's uh, work we've done a while ago. It's a relatively popular indoor data set. It's, um, it's recorded a structure sensor. Um, it's similar to a Kinect. And what you have is you're going to have semantic labels on top of these uh, scans. And um, for every surface point, you know which object class it is, right? So for this is a sofa chair, right? This is another chair. This is the floor. This is the wall and so on. Um, in this case, you want to train a neural network, right? That you basically predict a class label for each of these surface points. Um, and this is what 3D semantic segmentation is. Same idea what you had in 2D, you can then do in 3D. And then you can go further and say you can do instant segmentation, object detection, all these kind of things. They all work in 3D. But now I wanted to talk a little bit about the volumetric grids. I wanted to talk about how do you do, um, how do you feed the data into the network, you know? 
Um, we've discussed already a little bit how convolutions work, right? I mean, that's something you should probably know by now. Um, the 3D operator and 3D on a voxel grid seems relatively straightforward. Um, but there's actually a couple of different data structures you can use. Um, one thing you can do is occupancy grids. That's what I mentioned before, where you say, oh, for every, for every, well, I guess I should quickly, for those who don't, don't know it yet, the, the vo um, volumetric structures, the voxel grids, um, a voxel is the same as a pixel, but in 3D, right? So we have a 3D array for every spatial location, we have one associated cell. And the simplest version of that is the occupancy grid. So for every voxel where there's a surface point, you're just gonna say it's occupied, right? Um, and if it's not occupied, it's, it's, it's gonna be zero. So occupied is one and not occupied is zero, right? Um, you can have an occupancy grid where you only model the surface. You can also have a solid voxelization where you say, oh, I'm gonna voxel everything inside the object. So it depends a little bit how you generate it. Um, most of the time when we're talking about it right now, we're gonna talk about only the hull. So only the surface will be modeled, right? Not the interior, because if you're having a 3D scanner, we can only scan the surface, but not what's, what's behind it. Um, there's also things like ternary grids um, that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so for ternary grids, what you do is you encode free space and occupied space the same way as the occupancy grid, but you have a third state that tells you you don't know what it is. So in other words, if I have a 3D scanner and I'm taking like, I have my hand here, right? And I'm looking right now from my eyes, I'm looking to my hand, right? So I'm looking here. Um, if I measure the distance from my hand to my eye and I know this depth value, um, I know that there's a surface point here on my hand. If this hand moves, this, this depth value will change, right? Um, what I do know is I know that everything here in front of my hand is free space, right? Because if there was an object in front of my hand, I would have not measured my hand. I would have measured whatever object is in front of my hand, right? But if I have observed the depth value, I know, well, there might be some uncertainty in, in a, you know, plus minus a few centimeters where this hand is, but when I have the depth value here, I know there's nothing in front of it. So there's free space in front of my hand right now. However, on the other hand, I do not know what is behind my hand. If I only have my current, like if I basically have um, this piece of paper here, right? Um, I, I only know what's in front of the piece of paper, but I don't know what's behind it. So everything in front of it, I know is free space. Everything behind it, I have no idea. There could be another object behind it. There could also be no object behind it. And this is what the ternary grids are encoding. So the ternary grids say, is it a surface point? Yes or no. Is it free space or is it unknown space, right? And so you basically have three, three states you can, you can associate to a voxel. And this helps you quite a bit, right? For instance, if you're combining 3D scanning information from different views, like I have seen like this surface here again, right from the front and from the back, then I know that all of it is free space and that's much more information that, for instance, the neural network can leverage in order to do proper classification. Um, yeah, then there's implicit functions. These are distance fields and sign distance fields. So a distance field is also anchored in a voxel grid, but instead of just having a binary yes or no answer, every voxel is encoding how far is it to the closest surface. So distance field in practice looks like that. So look at this ship here, right? Um, this ship is a 3D shape. Everything on top of the surface here is going to be zero. Zero means there's a surface point. And if I'm going to deviate one voxel away from my surface, I will have a distance value of one. If I go two voxels away from my surface, I will have a distance value of two. And every voxel tells me basically how far am I away from the closest surface point. That means in a distance field, every voxel on the surface will be zero. And the further I go away from the surface, the higher the distance values go. Um, well, what does it help us with? If you took, for instance, the gradient in this distance field, you would directly point to the surface, right? Basically, um, the, the, the gradient of the distance field tells you how to find the surface. So in this case, you're actually encoding quite some information, which is much more than the occupancy grid. 
The next thing what you do is, it's not just the surface point is typically not exactly on a voxel center, right? So what you can do is this distance field gives you some sort of super resolution because you can uh, you can do a trinary interpolation between the distance values on the voxel grid, and that defines the surface that could be between two voxels, right? So you get a higher resolution with a distance field. Um, often what people do, they say, well, the distance values are only relevant close to the surface. So they say they store only distance values, I don't know, within plus minus and three voxels of the surface, and everything that is further away than three voxels will be clamped to three. In this case, this would be a truncation. Um, so often people use truncated distance fields. Um, they say, well, you know, I have all the signal in my neighborhood of the surface, that's where I care about, that's where I want to, for instance, learn features from, and if it's further away, it's not, it's not so relevant, like just ignore it or clamp it to some maximum value. So that would be a truncated distance field. Um, so these are distance fields, they are these implicit notations. Um, of a 3D shape, and you basically get the super resolution in, in this 3D voxel grid, right? Um, there's also sine distance fields, and sine distance field is the analog what we had in the, in the ternary grids. So the sine value tells us whether it's in front or behind the surface, which is, again, if I have this, this piece of paper here, everything here in front of it would have a positive distance value, and everything behind it would have a negative distance value, right? So this is what a sine distance field is. It's the same as the ternary grid. Now, the sine then means, is it known free space? Or if it's negative, is it unknown space, which I don't really know. I only know how far it is behind the surface. Um, so the sine distance field in principle store the most information here, right? Because they, they tell you, A, you have the advantage of a continuous representation of the surface because it's a distance field. Um, but in addition to that, you also um, you also have the sign value that tells it whether it's non-free space or whether it's unknown space behind the surface. Um, often for many scanning applications, we use sign distance fields anyway for the surface reconstruction. Um, there's papers like, um, like Kinect Fusion, um, this very old paper from Curlis and Levoy. If you're interested in it, uh, check out these works. That's very it's very interesting how to you know accumulate different frames from different frames, as or how you accumulate the depth values from different frames and then get a, a surface reconstruction. Um, and the nice thing is you can actually do direct feature extraction with a neural network in 3D on top of these reconstructions. Um, yeah, I put some some numbers here um, uh, for for shape completion. Um, so shape completion um, is one of the examples um, that you can do, for instance, as generative models here. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the numbers, that's maybe not so interesting, um, but what's interesting is that you can have different resolutions. So in this case, you see, if you're doing shape completion, you're going to get resolutions often for like 32 cubed, 128 cubed. So it's not super high, right? Um, and the reason why it's not super high is because, of course, it needs a lot of memory right now to define the convolutions, right? So convolutions now have three dimensions. Well, it's actually three plus one. So it's three spatial dimensions plus one for the feature depth, right? Um, so actually the convolutions become 40, right? If I run a convolution in 2D, they are three dimensional because um, I'm gonna have X and Y and then the feature depth where um, that is dependent on the channels of the previous layer. Okay, um, I already mentioned one of the tasks in addition to, to classification could be shape completion. Um, the reason why I'm mentioning it, it's a relatively straightforward uh, paper actually that uses an autoencoder architecture. So you have, for instance, um, a distance field here um, plus an observed state. Essentially, that's a sine value. That's a, a, a sine distance function. Um, it's anchored in a 32 cube grid. What you do is you have a 3D encoder maps to latent space, 3D decoder maps back to a distance field. Again, 32 cubed. Note, I don't want to talk about this classification network right now. I just want to look at these things. This is an encoder and a decoder, and you have some skip connections. So this is basically a unit in 3D, right? Nothing special about it. Um, what's interesting, though, is this one takes as input a distance field plus observed state. The distance field, again, is this embedding of the 3D shape, and the distance field is this known space versus unknown space. Uh, this one looks like this as input. This is the... Uh, input to, to the network that is uh, encoded as a 32 cube grid in this sine distance field um, and it's a partial 3D scan and the goal is you want to predict a complete scan like this one here, right? 
Um, and now the output is a distance field. So input sign distance field, output distance field. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is so you can see what the sign means. The sign in this case means if it's negative, I don't know the answer if it's occupied or not, or if it's in front or behind the surface. But the job of the network is to force a prediction for every voxel. Right? Here I have some partial scans. I don't know everything. And the network is supposed to predict a value everywhere. And this is what this distance field here is going to give you. Um, yeah, there's a few more tricks now in this method. Um, this one is maybe not the most important one. You can combine completion features here. This is from the encoder decoder structure. Uh, it's a unit with skip connections. Um, you can also run a 3D classifier, append these features in the latent space, and hope you get better results. Um, what's interesting about this, this classifier actually didn't help too much, um, but the other way helped a lot actually. <laughs> um, if you're doing a completion network with an autoencoder uh, and using these features here, in addition to the classification features for classification, then the classifier gets a whole lot better. So the classifiers benefit a whole lot um, from the completion. The other way around, maybe not so much, but um, it's quite an interesting argument because you can basically learn 3D structures and because you're learning 3D structures, um, you're getting better classification results. Um, now this is for shape completion. Um, you can do, the reason why this works is, well, in this case, I have a 32 cube grid, right? And I'm feeding in, um, I'm feeding in uh, one single shape that is always anchored in this 32 cube grid. Now, if I'm talking about 3D scenes, um, like semantic segmentation in 3D, um, I will find a very interesting problem very quickly. And one problem is that my scenes at test time, also training time, they're going to have a different size every time which is confusing, right? Because for standard convolutional neural networks, what we have seen, um, that an image is mostly the same. If I'm running a VGG architecture, they always take the, what is it, two, 224 squared images as input, right? Um, so that is something that is in 3D is very different. In 3D, we're gonna have basically an arbitrary scene size, an arbitrary scan size. Like if I have a car going through a whole city and I wanna do semantic segmentation for every point that my LiDAR scanner is getting, I have a pretty big scenery. Um, one thing what you can do is you can define things like semantic segmentation in 3D um, on chunks of the data. So what you could do is in this case, I'm going to take as input um, a 62 times 31 times 31 voxel grid, right? Um, 62 is the height. Um, I don't know. I think this was roughly, uh, um, I don't know, like three, four centimeters, so such that it's basically two, three meters in height. Um, and this block is like 1.5 meters to two meters square or so in width and, 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 uh, and depth. Um, but the important thing is basically, you can run a sub chunk of the data as input. So it's 62 times 31 times 31. You run a 3D continent. Um, you're gonna get a classification vector for the center voxel column. So we're gonna get, for these 62 values, in the middle of this chunk, we're gonna get results right now. So we're gonna get 62 classification, uh, sorry, we're gonna get classification scores for 62 voxels. In this case, we have 22 classes. So each of these 62 voxels will get 22 class uh, scores as output. Um, and the way you then run this whole thing is you slide it through, right? So for every middle column here of these chunks, you're gonna slide it through. I'll show this in a second how this looks like. Um, but basically, you just run the network many, many times at training time, uh, test time, and at training time, you train it on separate chunks independently. Um, in this case, it's an occupancy grid as input. It, it's a, a known unknown space, so it's this ternary grid what I mentioned, and the output is a 22-dimensional class vector per voxel, and we have 32, uh, sorry, 62 voxels that we're predicting values for at the same time. Okay. Um, this is an arbitrary choice. This is a bit of an older paper. In practice, you would also use a sign distance field today. It just works a little bit better. Um, the sliding window I mentioned, in practice, what we have is we have now a 3D scene, right? Um, again, these are my different classes. This is a voxelization of the scene. This are the brown thing on the walls, right? This is the floor. Um, uh, this is a bed, I think. Um, I think this is the table and so on, right? And 
this is a current chunk that we're cropping out, right? The scenes are uh, aligned with the X, Y axis. And now what you're doing is you're basically running this network for each location. You do this at training and you do this at test time, right? At training time, you just randomly sample it and at test time, you would do it in, in a structured way, right? Um, and yeah, then you basically can get these kind of predictions that you're seeing here. And the good thing is, by running the sliding window version, uh, this is actually independent of the size, right? You can run this for arbitrary large scenes, but the downside is, of course, it's going to be very slow. Um, the nice thing, um, I, sh I should have a few things later to that, um, but the nice thing is you could, this is a 2017 paper, nowadays you would do this also fully convolutional. The nice thing is if you have convolutions, you could also do this in one shot. Um, similar ideas what uh, what other people had in 2D for semantic segmentation, like the FCN paper uh, from Berkeley. Um, you can do these kind of tricks in 3D as well. Um, you can do other things like um, not just 3D semantic segmentation, you can actually also use these 3D networks for surface reconstruction. A very cool paper actually is um, SurfaceNet. Uh, SurfaceNet, what they do is um, they take images as input. This is an image, this is an image. And now what they're doing is they're projecting the color of this pixel value here to every voxel along this ray, this pixel to every vox, uh, color voxel, uh, every color uh, of this pixel to these voxels along this ray. And then they're running a 3D confident on these back projected color values uh, in order to get the surfaces output. Um, they're running it on 32 cube blocks. Um, they're running it on a relatively high resolution, meaning these 32 cube blocks are relatively small. Uh, in terms of spatial extent, so it takes really a long time. So this is maybe maybe not the best idea to do it, um, but it's a pretty cool paper actually. I, I like this one a lot because they got really good uh, reconstruction results. The only downside is it took a really long time. Now, I mentioned this already, the way to do this in practice is you would do this in a fully convolutional sense. Uh, and this is one idea, what you can do, uh, similar to this, again, this Berkeley paper uh, in 2D, uh, you can train, in this case, you just train on chunks. So you have a partial chunk here and you're trying to force the shape completion of this chunk. Um, again, this is also a simple autoencoder network. There's nothing special about it. Um, but you're training on these chunks of, um, let's say, I don't know, a few cube meters in size. And then what you do is, if this is fully convolutional, you can apply this to an entire scene at the same time. Right? Um, and what does the entire scene at the same time mean? Well, these are convolutions. Convolutions are spatially invariant. So we can run this on a single forward pass, assuming you fit in the entire scene here as input. Um, and what's pretty funny is in this case um, of this work, um, this one fits on a GPU for most sceneries of a whole floor. So you can do shape completion or semantic segmentation on the whole floor uh, in one shot. Um, yeah, there's a few things to make the predictions here better. It's not just a simple auto uh, encoder. You can do things like autoregressive models in 3D. It's similar to the pixel CNN, but in 3D. Um, the idea is you have these parallel autoregressive networks where you have like voxel group one, voxel group two, voxel group three, voxel group four, and so on. So basically what you're doing is you're predicting these voxels first, then these voxels that are adjacent to it next, conditioned on these ones, then the next voxel group conditioned on the first two, then the fourth one conditioned on the first three, and so on. So instead of, in so this parallel autoregressive stuff in 2D had four groups, right? Um, now we have in, now we're in 3D, we have to uh, cluster the voxels into a set of eight distinct uh, joint sets where each of them doesn't have any neighbors in itself, right? So this one has no adjacent neighbors by itself, this one doesn't have any neighbors by itself, and so on. So practically what you do is you're training eight networks, so you have these parallel autoregressive networks in 3D. Um, you can also do stuff like um, course to find predictions. Uh, in this case, uh, you can feed, uh, you can just train this in low resolution first, then taking these predictions, feeding these ones to the next level in, you have a partial scene here again, you get the predictions of the next level, again, feed this to the next level and so on. So in practice, in this case, uh, we have three times eight networks that we're training, um, one, two, three for the hierarchy levels, uh, eight uh, for the autoregressive blocks, and then you can run this stuff on an entire scene in one shot. So you get scenes that look like these ones as input. This is the partial scenes. Um, and you're getting predictions that, that roughly look like these ones here, right? So, um, and it's pretty nice. And this runs in one shot and you get actually pretty pretty decent 
3D reconstructions that you can use here. Um, this method also does the semantic segmentation in parallel. And this has also been shown that basically if you do completion and segmentation at the same time, um, the, the completion helps the semantics. The other way around, not, not that much. Um, so if you're looking at the conclusions so far, um, I mean, it's very intuitive what we're doing here, right? We basically have volumetric grids. They are relatively easy to understand. Um, they can encode the free space uh, very well. Um, they can be encoded with, well, you can use distance fields, right? Um, in order to get super resolutions of the voxels. But we're going to always run into issues like memory, right? Uh, in memory, in this case, we're running both at, for the total training data size because this stuff is really heavy, right? Um, I mean, you can get it, right? If, you, if you're feeding in a 128 cubed uh, voxel grid with a floating point number for each voxel, that's quite a lot of memory, right? If we have like, I don't know, a few million training samples. So it needs a lot of memory. Um, it also needs a lot of processing time because you have to generate the voxelization um, and everything runs in 3D. Well, in the network, then it's in 3 plus 1 if you consider the feature depth as well. Um, the good thing is you can use sliding windows or fully convolutional networks. In practice, you would now always do fully convolutional network as long as you uh, fit it into memory at test time. Um, and that's pretty nice because then you, uh, yeah, then you can basically uh, try these kind of things um, on, on arbitrary large scenes. So you can train on arbitrary chunks, right? But you can test, um, sorry, you train on fixed size chunks and then you can test on arbitrary scenes. Um, yeah. So if you're looking at the memory, that's obviously going to be a big problem. Um, one thing we will see very, very quickly here is if you're taking a 3D shape and you're voxelizing it, the higher the voxels, the higher the voxel resolution goes, the smaller the occupancy gets. In other words, I will have fewer voxels that will have a one and more voxels, relatively speaking, that will have a zero. And of course, we want to have a higher resolution because we want to capture all the fine scale detail, right? We want to capture all these details here at the bottom. It's not a high resolution, but it's at least higher than this one, right? So we're going to uh, 10, uh, from 10% occupancy here, I think this is 32 cubed, to um, 128 would be 2.1 percent, right? It's quite a it's quite a difference actually. So, and this is actually the main issue in the memory right now. We are very inefficient in terms of encoding these uh, shapes if you're talking about um, the volumetric encoding. And one way you could think about it is, well, we want to reduce the memory, so maybe we only want to reduce the memory. Oh, we only want to store the voxels explicitly that are close to the surface, right? At some point, this becomes just much easier. And one way to do that is using volumetric hierarchies. Um, the idea is basically you want to have a high resolution when you're close to the surface and a low resolution when you're far enough away, because when you're far enough away, you just want to store a high distance value or an empty block anyway. Uh, and this is a, a very, there's a couple of papers that did this, Ocnet, OCNN are, are popular examples of that. They did this for shape classification. So um, let's have a look at this one here first. If I'm having a dense confnet, what I would have is, this is my low resolution, I'm encoding my shape here. Um, I subdivide it and I subdivide it again and basically I have a lot of voxels here that are not, not related to the surface. The idea of Ocnet is I have a volumetric hierarchy in this case, in 2D, it would be an octree. Um, sorry, in 2D, it would be a quadtree. And in 3D, it would be an octree. And um, that's why it's called octnet. Um, so the idea is, so this is the visualization is a quadtree, of course, right? So you have the, um, this is the original resolution, right? This is an eight cubed resolution. But now what you, what you can do is you can say, well, here, this one, you have only at a very high resolution here when it's far away. And then when it's closer, you subdivide it once, basically, right? Or here you subdivide it twice, or here you subdivide it three times, right? And the idea is, if I'm using a distance field, right? Um, or if I use an occupancy grid, this whole voxel tells me that this whole space here is empty. Which is enough, in this case, because it's far enough away from the surface, that I know all of the stuff in there is empty. If there was a voxel in it that is not empty, I would have to subdivide it, right? But I would do this subdivision adaptively, and because of that, I'm saving a lot of memory. 
In this case, I can do that. Um, for discriminative tasks, it's relatively easy, like classification, because I do know the structure of my model. I know the 3D shape already in advance, right? Um, and because of that, I know how to do the subdivision. And this is why OCNET um, and, o and OCNN work relatively well for these tasks, right? Um, and yeah, and if you compare it here, you see like this is encoding the same surface than here, but you just need significantly, significantly less memory here, right? Um, okay, so in terms of performance, um, it's, it's relatively interesting. I mean, this is what they cited in the paper. I think in terms of performance, what they showed is, well, at some point you plateau in terms of accuracy. Um, this is what they had as a baseline with the dense net. The oct net was a little bit better. Um, but essentially, the image, uh, the input resolution, um, at some point it plateaus, but at the beginning, if you have a very low resolution, you have, you get a, you have a penalty in terms of the classification accuracy you're having at the end. Um, so octnet basically shows that you get dense net and octnet get basically the same performance, but the octnet needs significantly less memory. I don't have the exact numbers here, but it's at least a factor of 10 or so, maybe even more. Um, and that is pretty good because one of them grows cubically and the other one grows quadratically, which is kind of the nature of a cubic grid, right? Um, state of the art is a little bit higher, um, but that's mostly because of like different architectures and so on. Um, but the interesting thing about Octnet is once you encode the network like that, if you're running, a, uh, if you're running a lookup, you just check if I want to interpolate between this voxel and that voxel, you just interpolate between those two. So in this case, from a surface, it's, it's an identical representation of what Octnet can encode. However, there's one small difference. Um, it's not so small. The feature maps are also being reduced. So in other words, this feature map, I have less storage for this region of a feature map than I would have here. So in principle, you could say, maybe it is useful for the network to have valuable features stored in these voxels here, that here you don't have space for. So that one you can argue, but this one doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make a big, a big performance hit. For some stuff, it is a little bit worse in terms of performance, but it just requires so much less memory that this is a relatively cool architecture. Um, you can do similar things for generative tasks. In this case, uh, we want to infer the structure. So we have um, dense at the beginning, right? And then we have two octree levels that basically, um, there's two of them, two of these papers, uh, uh, appeared. One of them I really like is this octree generating networks. So here the idea is they train this actually end to end. So what they do is um, the end method is basically saying for every voxel you're going to predict is it fully empty or is it fully occupied or is it partially occupied. If it's partially occupied in the process you will do a subdivision and this is not predetermined. So in this case the network makes a determination at test time whether a voxel has to be subdivided and be allocated more space. Um, and this one can be trained end to end. So basically you have the dense version, then you predict one octree level, next octree level, next octree level, and so on. Um, so that's pretty cool. And this works for generative tasks. Um, I like it a lot when this is end to end trained because basically then the, the fine scale structure will tell you how you have to subdivide the early levels here because you get gradients for it. Okay, so the conclusion so far here, um, the hierarchies, they're great at reducing memory and runtime, right? Because you just need a fraction of the storage, um, and because of that, you can also make it faster. It does come at a little bit of a performance hit. That's what I was mentioning is basically the feature maps are not stored everywhere anymore, right? So um, yeah, you don't have the same amount of feature propagation what you would have in a dense grid. Um, it's a bit easier for discriminative tasks when you know the structure in advance, but it is possible for generative tasks too when you, you can just formulate this as classification, right? Where you say, oh, do you have to subdivide the voxel or not? Or is it partially occluded or not, right? Um, and this one works relatively well, I would say. Um, so hierarchies are pretty interesting. Um, yeah, this, this one is, 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 is quite funny. Um, one thing a lot of people at the time <clears throat> when these papers came out discussed was how much does the 3D part actually help? Right, And one type of networks uses actually multi-view information. So they're saying, well, 2D networks on images are pretty good. Um, you have pre-trained versions on ImageNet and stuff like that. Um, and the idea could be, maybe we want to use these features and protect them to 3D and then do something in 3D. Or we accumulate the, the, the features from multiple views. 
Um, this is very similar to what we've seen in neural rendering, except now this is for not for image generation, but it's for classification tasks. And there was this one cool paper, this multi-view confident paper uh, for 3D shape recognition. Um, these ones do uh, multi-view shape classification. So what you have is, this is purely synthetic. There's still no real data right now. Uh, you have a model here from ShapeNet. ShapeNet is this model database that people use often for 3D deep learning. Um, they, they do have a bunch of cameras here, virtual cameras around this object. They render this object from these, from these end views. Um, they get the rendered images. Now what they do is they're running a 2D conf net for each of these images independently. They're going to get a feature map for each of them. Um, but instead of doing the classification here on a per image basis for each of the renderings, they have a few pooling. So you have just a max pool, basically. You can do other pools, but they use the max pool. Um, this view pooling is nothing else but a max operator that selects the features from each of these maps. And then you have another CNN in, um, that works on the concatenated features here, oh, sorry, on the max pooled features. Uh, and then you get the classification scores. Uh, and this one can be trained end to end because the pooling is uh, differentiable, right? Um, and this worked remarkably well. And the reason why this works remarkably well is because these networks here, they all share, these are this is CNN one here, they all share the same feature, uh, the same weights. Um, these ones work so well because they are pre-trained on ImageNet, right? <laughs> so you can do your 2D pre-training and then do your view pooling and then you still aggregate information from multiple views at the same time. The other thing why this is a very nice network is this view pooling is independent of the number of images here. So I could train on five and then test on 10. So this is invariant to the number of images you're feeding here is input in. And this is pretty cool. Um, and it gave at the time actually pretty good results from these shape net classification tasks, uh, benchmarks. This was at that time, or it probably still is one of the best papers. Um, one disadvantage we have here though, this is a 2D network on the renderings and you're doing a few pooling over the feature maps. At this point, you're using the spatial correlation. You don't know anymore, like this pixel at the top here and this pixel at the top here, they will be pooled together, but they are totally different 3D positions, right? This part and this part here is a different 3D location, even though they are the same in 2D because the viewpoint changed, they're the same in 2D, but different 3D position, right? So that's a big problem. Um, yeah, so at the end of the day, we're still gonna get a classification vector and we're gonna get, um, yeah, we're gonna get uh, these results at the end of the day. In this case, only use the rendered RGB here and no spatial correlation was taken. Um, there's a way though to still maintain the spatial information and this is what people have been doing. Actually, it was the same group. Uh, uh, they did this for multi-view networks for shape seg segmentation. So in this case, the goal is you wanna have a 3D label for every surface point on this plane here. These are the wings, right, um, and so on. So you have a bunch of uh, a bunch of semantic labels for the object parts here. And the idea how this works is similar as before. So we're having a 3D shape. We're having a bunch of viewpoints around. Uh, for each of the viewpoints, we're rendering an image. Um, for each of these images, we're running a 2D segmentation network. In this case, FCN, right? That's just because it's an easy network. Um, for every pixel, you're going to get a confidence map for each semantic label. So these are the, the score functions for the classes, basically, for the semantic classes. For every pixel, it's a 2D semantic segmentation network. Now what's being done is these confidence maps are back projected again to the surface on the surface points, right? And then there's a conditional random field that is being run in order to aggregate these features. You could also run a, a like a per surface point pooling or something like this. It's, it's in a way similar. Um, but in this case, they use a CRF and then they have a loss functions for the labels that is being uh, predicted based on the combination of these per, per few object maps that are back projected to 3D and fed into this uh, conditional random field. And this CRF is actually differentiable so they can train this whole process all end to end. And the nice thing here is right now, now we maintain um, the spatial structure. Right? So in this case, due to the spec projection steps, this point of the wing and this point of the wing will be mapped back to the same surface point. Right? 
Um, and I turn it end to end, and I think this is a pretty, uh, a pretty cool, a pretty cool idea. Um, yeah, there's a few things you can try. Um, one thing we realized at some point, we played around with this a little bit. Um, when you do multi-view rendering, so you have a 3D shape here, uh, you're gonna get a 3D shape, you can voxelize it. Um, you can have different renderings how to render this voxel grid. You can render the mesh, you can render the voxel grid. One thing we tried is we used a multi-view sphere rendering, so you can render each voxel as a sphere, and this worked surprisingly well. Um, you can also render these spheres at multiple resolutions, and at the time of this, of this model at 40 benchmark, that's also another benchmark on this shape classification, um, these spheres work surprisingly better than everything else. So apparently the pre-trained image net features were very good for this kind of combination. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of cool. So in this case though, none of these networks right now explicitly use the 3D information right away, but they use a 2D rendering, right? And then there's gonna be some sort of feature aggregation <coughs> in the 2D domain, right? Um, now, again, I mentioned this, this, this question what I raised before is, now which one is better? Do we do it in 3D or do we do these like 2D renderings and kind of circumvent the problem that we do it in 3D? Now, the idea is we can use hybrids between those. We can use volumetric networks and we can use multi-view networks. And specifically for real 3D scans, this is very interesting. Um, because in the real 3D scans, I'm going to have a geometric channel from the geometry from a LiDAR scanner, for instance, or from a Kinect, but I also have RGB signal from an RGB camera. Um, and the first thing what, you know, what people, and also we tried that is, uh, it's a very simple experiment. So we tried to do semantic segmentation, in this case on, on ScanNet. Um, and the idea was, if you're only feeding in the geometry in a 3D ConfNet, you're going to get something like, 54-ish percent class accuracy, average class accuracy, right? Uh, it's not a super tuned network. It, it performed reasonably well, but it's 54. Um, that was kind of a baseline. And then we thought, hmm, now if we're adding the color values, we should get a higher signal, right? We, for every voxel, we're just gonna add, uh, add a color value now. And just in the 3D voxels, we write one color value per voxel. So this geometry plus voxels. Um, and this increased the number, but only very, very marginally. So we were disappointed when we saw that number. We thought like, mm, okay, so color only helps you by like 1%. That's not so great. We thought it would be nice if you combined it, we would get better results. Um, and the reason why this doesn't work better is because there's a huge resolution mismatch. Uh, in other words, when you have a depth sensor, typically the depth is at lower resolution and the color is at a higher resolution. Now, in this case, this network here learns at the same resolution because yeah, you know, we're feeding in one color value and one occupancy value per voxel in. Uh, and that's a big mismatch. So then you can't really take advantage of the color. So the, the remedy to that is this hybrid network that I already hinted. So in this case, you say, we're going to have a 3D scan, right, with a geometry. And this scan has also been the associated RGB images like these ones here. Uh, and the hope is that we want to predict semantic labels for each of the surface points here, right? Like this bed, floor, chairs, couch, and so on, right? Um, and the idea is, because we have this, the alignments of the, of the images here to the scan, uh, we, can actually, um, we can actually design a, a hybrid network that leverages both at the same time. And the idea is relatively easy. So what you're doing is you have the color input here. Um, and with the color input, you're extracting 2D features. And these 2D features are done with a 2D network independently. Um, you're back projecting these features to 3D. And these back projected features to 3D are then, then projected to the voxels. But the difference now is it's not color values that are being back projected here. It's actually voxels that get feature maps already. So because there's a 2D network that runs and extracts features on every image independently, these networks can also be pre-trained on ImageNet. Um, they are better than just having like the naive color resolution, uh, but can already encode some information about the appearance in the local region, right? And the idea is you're back projecting features from a 2D network. So extract, you're running a 2D network for every image first, getting 2D features, back projecting these to 3D, back projecting them to the voxels. Now, you're running um, a 3D conf on the voxels, right? 
And, and then what you can do is you also get a 3D feature map here for the voxels, for the geometry. You get a feature map here for the color. You know? And then what you do is you just concatenate these two and then you get the class labels together. So architecturally speaking, this looks like that. Um, let's start here. We have here the 3D geometry. We have a bunch of 3D cons, a bunch of more 3D cons. And for every voxel, uh, we're going to predict semantic labels, right? So it's like, depending on how many classes we have, that's how many score outputs we have per voxel. Um, now we have 2D images. On the 2D images, we run a 2D network. We're getting 2D features. In this case, you have a 2D loss. It's a proxy loss that's just a semantic segmentation in 2D. But instead of the 2D labels, um, the 2D features are being back projected from each of the 2D images to a 3D volume. And then there's a bunch of 3D confs that run on these back projected features on color. Then these are in the same space in the geometry, then they're being concatenated with the geometry, and then they're being run. There's one small caveat. Um, sometimes you have voxels that are not seen by any 2D images, then you just zero out the features. Sometimes you have voxels that are seen by one image, then you just have this feature map that you back project. Sometimes you also have multiple uh, images that have seen one voxel. In this case, you just do simple max pooling. So it's invariant to how many images have seen that actually, right? Um, so that's kind of a nice, uh, that's kind of a nice idea actually. Um, yeah, and the good thing is this whole thing can be trained end to end. Um, and now the big question remains, if you're taking color only, so if you're only taking this part here at the bottom, have 3D cons in here, or we have the geometry only, we're getting these two results. If you color using color only, you're getting 58% classification accuracy. Geometry only, you're getting 54.4% accuracy. Um, so what does it tell us? It tells us color and geometry work roughly the same. Color has a little bit of more signal in this case for the specific architecture, but that's not really my point. There's like 4%, it's not such a big difference. Um, but the interesting thing is what happens if we train them now both at the same time and then we're getting 75% accuracy. So the assumption here is that both color and geometry have complementary signals um, that significantly help each other to get better results at the end of the output. Okay, you can also try this out with um, yeah, different, uh, different views. You can have a varying number of views. The more views you're using, the better you get, but eventually you're going to plateau. So in this case, the, the state of the art was like 75% accuracy or so. Um, yeah, this is the full ablation table here. Um, this is when you only use one image, then you get 27. If you had three images, only the images, you get 44. Um, if you're running the 3D cons afterwards, only on the color still, then you get 58. If you're running only the geometry, you get 54. If you're running 3D geometry plus voxel colors, you get 55.9, almost the same. Color per voxels doesn't work. But now if you're adding the features in and more views, then we're getting more and more better results. So features better than colors from 2D because then each feature is already encoding like a, a region, so to, so to say, and we can use pre-trained 2D images. So these hybrid networks, they're a really nice way to combine geometry and color information. And as we expected, or as we hoped, there's actually different signal in color and geometry, which is pretty nice, right? So this is a very nice thing. Um, so this gives great performance. It's the best so far for uh, segmentation. Um, State-of-the-art networks still use kind of similar things. They might use a little bit different 3D architectures, um, but this is still the best way to combine color and geometry, right? End-to-end um, -end helps less than we hoped for. This one, if I go quickly back here, uh, this one is when you're not training end-to-end -end, and when you're training end-to-end -end, only makes half a percent of difference. That's it's a bit disappointing. We thought this was better. Um, but it is okay. Um, it could be a bit faster. You basically have one loop that goes around every image, but it's okay. You can do it relatively efficient, um, still in like almost real time or interactively. Okay. So these so far were volumetric networks um, that operate in voxel grids. Now, the alternatives to that is, um, this is what many people do today, is use point clouds. Um, so point clouds, um, is for every 3D point that you're capturing with a LiDAR sensor, instead of mapping into a unified voxel grid, you just store a linear list of 3D points, right? So a point is X, Y, and Z, tells you a spatial location, and then you have, I don't know, like a thousand, two thousand, three, four thousand points uh, in a linear array. Um, and you can do deep learning directly on the point clouds. I mentioned before, this is a, a 1D encoding. You could use a convolution, 
But people tried that and it's not so great if you just naively do a convolution on a 1D array because you're convolving over spatially uh, disjoint regions, right? So that's not so ideal. Um, a very popular paper, this is from um, Stanford, is PointNet. So uh, PointNet is a paper for uh, doing things like classification, part segmentation, or semantic segmentation on the point clouds directly. Um, and the way this works is basically they got rid of the convolutions. Um, they basically use fully, uh, uh, they use MLPs, they use fully, uh, fully connected layers. And the idea is you have an input point cloud here that is n times three. So you have n points, every point has three uh, locations, x, y, and z. That's what I said, right? Um, the idea is you basically run an MLP here um, on this array and you're gonna get a bunch of features out of it. Well, you're running this for a couple of layers, right? Um, and eventually after this series of fully connected layers on the points, you're gonna get um, 1024 feature vector for every point. So it's n times 1024. And now the, the high level thought is, well, this point cloud is unstructured, right? So you have an unstructured point cloud and what you would love to do is do some sort of sorting. We don't know really how sorting works. So the only thing what we can do is we can run a max pool operator to select the most indicated features. So what you can do now is you run a max pool of the 1024 features that you would like to extract from this n times 1024 feature vector. So we get a global feature vector of 1024 length. And then you run simply another multi-layer perceptron um, to get output scores. So ignore the, the stuff here at the top, at the bottom first. Like just look at the blue stuff. This is a classification network. So you get points as input, you run MLPs, eventually you do max pooling to get a global vector. This max pooling concatenates all the features from different regions basically, right? Um, and then you run another MLP and you're gonna get output scores for the shape classification. And this thing can also be trained end to end of course. And this is the basic version of pointment. Now, what you're doing here is you're losing, when you do this max pool, you're losing the spatial correlations, of course, right? You're just getting features, you're aggregating the features, and then essentially you're kind of voting, so to say, what to do with that. Uh, you're getting output scores for that. Um, the interesting thing is these global features, they lose the spatial information, right? For classification, this is fine because we just want to know is it a chair, is it a sofa, is it a couch? If we did semantic segmentation, then we would have a problem because we would have to map this back to the global to the global shape again. And this is what they did for the semantic segmentation network here. Uh, so you have here these n times 24. Uh, you have 24 dimensional vectors here per point. You have n for every point, right? It's n, n points. Now what you do is you simply concatenate this, the global feature vector to each of them. So this, the very same 1024 feature dimensions that defines the entirety of the point cloud um, is being concatenated to each point feature. And then you have another bunch of multi-layer perceptrons that operate on this point level. And then you get n times m outputs. So for every point, you're gonna get m output scores, uh, where m is the number of uh, uh, classes that you have, right? Um, for semantic segmentation. And this one now is spatially correlated because this one is for every n, you're getting m dimensional output scores, right? Um, Okay, well, that's it, that's point net. And the idea is this whole thing can also be trained end to end, of course. So you can do this for semantic segmentation and you can do this for shape classification. Um, this was a very fundamental paper because this was the first one that showed that you can do these kind of things on points and don't need to go with this like painful, painful process of converting everything uh, to volumetric grid. Um, one drawback of point net was it's very dependent on the sampling of the points. If you have a lot of points in one region and very few points in another region, um, this is going to be an issue. So that's why the same group proposed, um, this is a group from Stanford, um, they proposed point net plus plus, which is essentially addressing this issue of, of the sampling mismatch. So the idea is kind of, they have various, they have kind of a multi-scale grouping of, of point nets. They have very many point nets, um, locally speaking. So they learn this hierarchical rep representation of a point cloud 
and then they apply multiple point nets at the different locations and scales and then they aggregate this later on right so in each scale they do further point sampling they have some way of making this as uniform as possible and then they have a multi-scale um, multi-resolution grouping for sampling density of the robustness and this one gives much better results, especially when you have larger scenes, right? When you have some sort of sampling mismatch, and you often get these sampling mismatches because um, it depends on the locations of the um, of the of the points. So this these two papers, PointNet and PointNet plus plus, are very popular architectures to do stuff in three D. Um, they're very lightweight architectures; they don't have a lot of weights, um, and they don't use convolutions, which is funny enough. So people thought, well, maybe we can also use convolutions. Um, and there's a couple of papers like these. Um, there's point convolutions. Um, what you can do for point convolutions is basically uh, you transform the points to some sort of um, R3 space representation like radial basis functions or stuff like that. Then you convolve in this space um, and you strict the results to the points and basically project it back. Um, so these kind of papers for points work to some degree. Um, and when I'm saying to some degree, most of the time, these methods, they didn't propose to use real data yet. And one challenge for real data is that if you're missing like a chair leg, you don't in the point cloud, you don't have an encoding that there's no information there. You just don't have any points there. But like the, 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 the free space information that you would have in a volumetric grid is not in here, right? You don't have a sign distance field here. So for real data, the convolutions are not so ideal. Like they didn't seem to work so well. And um, there's a few new versions of it, um, but practically speaking, that's a, a bit of a, a problem. So, but the conclusion so far of the point nets is they train very, very fast. They're also super lightweight for testing. So if you want to do something on a phone or so, point cloud, uh, point net versions are, are pretty good. Um, they can cover very large spaces, depending on the sampling density, of course. If you run like an 8 or 60k points, you can cover basically a whole room. You run it in one shot. Uh, and it's very, very light, right? This is a very big advantage. The big disadvantage is what I said, is they cannot represent the free space, which is you're missing a bunch of information that the sensor would give you, but you're not using as part of your network training. Um, that explain, you know, um, if you want to see that again, just go back in the video. Um, so the performance in practice is worse than the volumetric ones. Like this is still, like we have to say that, right? I mean, if you're looking at the state of the art benchmarks, point net versions are super lightweight to train. They're easy to use. There's a lot of cool code bases online. If you want to get started, I always recommend use something like that because it's easy to use. But the, the overall performance is often a little bit worse. So that, that is often a bit of a, a challenge, right? Um, there's still a lot of ongoing research going on. Um, how, how to encode the points efficiently? When do you do, do you do convolutions locally, right? And then you aggregate globally with point nets and stuff like that. Um, so I added a couple of more references if you're interested in it. Um, yeah, there's uh, point net, of course, point net plus plus. Um, there's point CNN. That's also pretty interesting. It's currently, I think, on an archive paper. Um, these are global methods. Um, meaning that you take the whole point cloud at some point and you aggregate into a global feature vector in one way or another one. Um, what I think is pretty cool if you have these point sets local and then do the aggregation globally, right? Um, so there's there's a couple of things like tension space convolutions. Um, it's a cool paper. I really like that. Um, there's near and point neighbors. You basically have a point, you check the local neighborhood and then you, you run some operator first there to get some feature and then you run a point net afterwards or so. So there's, there's pretty interesting combinations in terms of doing something local first and then making global or vice versa. And I think that combination is kind of interesting um, also for future research. So if you're interested in this, I don't have the very recent ones. This is like 2018-ish. The archive paper is probably 2019 papers now. Um, there's still a lot of ongoing work. This is not, not solved at all. Um, so this is basically, in addition to volumes, we can do things on points. Um, another disadvantage of points is we don't represent the surface, right? Uh, if you're talking about 3D models from like computer graphics, you would think about, no, wait a second, you only have vertices, you don't have faces. Um, and that's indeed a disadvantage, so you have to have a sampling strategy, so sampling will always determine the performance in this case. Um, 
One thing to remedy here is mesh-based methods. So you can say, well, we're taking the surface points, but we're also going to go and have some triangles that interpolate values and stuff like that. Um, this is a very interesting area. It's very tricky because you need a bit of understanding how meshes work, a bit of differential geometry probably. Um, it also doesn't work so well, but in principle it has a lot of potential. And that's why I think it's really, this would be cool for more research. Um, there's a lot of cool work already by Michael Bronstein's group. Um, he's a professor at Imperial um, in London. And these guys, they, they define basically various ways um, convolutions on a mesh. And one idea what they can do is you can go into the plus Beltrami space, can take the eigen uh, can take the eigen functions in that space, and can do convolutions in that space. Now for synthetic meshes, like this data sets, like I think uh, what is it like Faust or so uh, some of these data sets, they all have synthetic data. For synthetic data sets, this works great. Um, but in practice, it's challenging because you, if you have partial data on a real scan these local operators like Laplace Beltrami changes significantly. So then the features will change and this is very difficult for the network to learn. So this is like a very interesting ongoing research direction, but it's not so clear how to solve it yet. So if you're interested in research, why this is, I think, a cool direction. Another thing what's pretty cool about the meshes is you can think about them as graphs. Again, like Michael, Michael Bronstein's group is doing a lot of cool stuff there. Um, they, like you can model it as faces and vertices and edges, right? Uh, and the idea is you can do operators on this connected graph. And, and this is very interesting, right? Because then you, you consider faces, vertices, and so on independently. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of interesting work uh, coming up um, that does it on graphs directly. Um, there's message passing networks and so on. So this is also, I think, a very interesting one. So the conclusions here so far is that meshes and surfaces, they typically use some differential geometric approximation. You need to know that. Um, the convolutions is then the space. Um, most of the time, I haven't seen a lot of results in real world data yet because they're very prone to noise and incomplete scans. So then these local differentiable geometric approximations don't work so well. This is a thing, but it's, I think this shouldn't prevent us as researchers to look into it because there's a lot of potential in it because ideally, if you represent the surface, you should be able to get pretty good results, right? Like you should in principle get better results than point net, but so far that doesn't seem to be the case. But again, I think marking this one to work on real scans, this would be cool. Um, okay, I have one last category I want to talk about. Um, and yeah, if this was a bit too fast, maybe pause the video for a second, take a coffee and then continue. Um, but the, um, the last category I want to talk is about sparse convolutions. Um, and this is in a sense an alternative to, um, well, it's kind of a combination of similar to points. Um, but it uses local convolutions, but only in the regions where we have actually a surface. So if we're visualizing this in 2D, um, we would get something like that, right? Uh, if you're running a conf operator in 2D, we have a regular convolution here. Um, we are starting now like this, running one conf, running another conf, running another conf. So the surface of this, of this circle here is kind of being di dilated into the rest of the image, right? So every conf is spreading the features into the space. Um, but what that means is we, we have, uh, the, the, I mean, at the beginning, we have a lot of zeros here on the outside and we only have active regions across the surface because there's features. So the set of active regions basically grows very quickly as, as soon as we're running confs. This is similar to what we had with um, dense, con dense convolutions on the volumetric grids versus um, the, uh, the operators uh, that we had uh, with like, um, like the hierarchies like octnet and so on, right? Um, yeah, so but there's two things here. So this takes a lot of memory because these active regions spread everywhere. And of course, at some point we have, we have occupancy everywhere. And the idea is, um, yeah, the idea here is the sparse convolutions don't spread it to non-active regions. So, the idea is, if I'm having a sparse convolution here, so if I'm dense, right, we're running it, it spreads. Uh, if it's sparse, the idea is you're running a masked kernel and only taking the regions that are active. So only the green regions here are active and the red regions are masked out. Again, green regions are active, red regions are masked out, and so on. And these kernels are learned. But the masking is depending on the data that is coming in. So whenever you don't have data, you just mask it out. 
But the nice thing is here, you can run these convolutions and after one layer, you still have the same active region. So whatever is green stays green, whatever stays red stays red, right? Uh, and this is pretty nice that so you can have basically convolutions only around the surface. So you don't have to even store this whole rest here. You never have to allocate any memory for it. Um, and in practice, it looks like that, right? So this kernel here is then being like used for, for the entirety. Of course, this can be done in parallel too. So the active set remains unchanged, green remains green, and red remains red. Um, and you might ask, how do we get feature propagation? Well, of course, this kernel, this is a three by three kernel here, but you have various size kernels. Um, this is called, uh, yeah, this, uh, this paper is called Submanifold Sparse Convolution Networks that did this. Um, but the, uh, the idea here is uh, that, of course, if you have varying kernel sizes and so on, um, you're connecting disconnected, uh, disconnected pieces if the kernels are larger. But at first, you might not communicate. So you need a couple of layers and so on, right? Um, so eventually, you will ha we'll have this by, by striding, pooling, confs, and so on. So you need to be careful how the kernel size and the strides and everything affects the rest, or dilation possibly too. Um, so yeah, these are this is a bit of a drawback, so you don't have features everywhere. But the nice thing is, you can run this at a really, really, really high resolution, right? Um, and in practice, how this is actually implemented, I'm not sure if I have this here. Um, yeah, in practice, this is implemented with a hash function. So what you're doing basically is, um, you just store every green voxel here, or every green pixel, you store as an active entry in the linear array. You only store the stuff that is active. And then when you run the convolutions, you know where you produce output. That's just a copy of this green array. And you know how to compute it. You just look up in a hash table, what are the previous entries that contribute um, to this current region of the next layer, right? Um, so it's very efficient to do. There's one indirection in the lookup, but I'm saving like whatever, 90% of my memory. So I can get go to really, really high resolution. So performance actually is slower because I have this interaction than a dense conf. Um, but I can have basically a significantly higher resolution. And the reason why this stuff, and I'll show you a few numbers later, um, why this stuff works so well is because you can just go to higher resolutions. So higher resolutions just give you better results for most tasks, right? You can capture more signal. Uh, these guys did this for a couple of things. They did it in, in 1D, uh, in 2D, uh, for like line drawings and so on, uh, and for 3D, um, where you have uh, uh, like uh, semantic segmentation and so on. So the conclusions here so far is, um, I mentioned that this is implemented with a spatial hash function. Um, if you're interested, look at the code. It's actually super easy to understand. So Facebook released this code. Um, they only have the features around the surface. Um, it requires significantly less memory. Be um, and so it allows for higher resolution, gives you better, better features, better performance, but slower runtime because you have this interaction of the hash table lookup, which is... It's doable on the GPU, but it's lower than the dense cons. Um, so I wanted to look at, uh, at a result here. <laughs> um, and this is the scanned benchmark. Um, you see here at the top, this sparse conf paper I mentioned, this is semantic segmentation. The numbers we need to look at is here. This is average IOU. This is separated by classes. This number here is 0.7 something, uh, which is a pretty high number. Um, so these sparse cons currently perform the best on this benchmark. So the reason why they perform best is they just can operate at a higher resolution than the dense convolutions. So this Minkowski net is actually a very similar idea, it also uses sparse convolutions. Um, I think they did a bunch of hyperparameter tuning. I think Minkowski is now in front of this, but they're very similar in terms of the techniques. Um, the idea is basically you have higher resolution because of that you're getting better numbers. Um, they don't, interestingly, they don't use any distance values. You could do that. We've tried this internally. It gave a bit better results still. Um, but it, it takes also a lot of uh, effort to get there. Um, there's texture-based versions. Like this is uh, TextureNet. Uh, I think this was CPL paper we had a while ago. Um, these methods, they basically run textures uh, on top of the mesh. Um, there's dense volumetric ones. This is like the 3D MV. That's what I showed you when you combine color and, uh, and geometry. In this case, it used dense convolutions. If you use this one with sparse cons, you actually here at the top again. Um, but color still helps. Um, if you're comparing here quickly, point net is roughly here. Um, so pointed architectures don't work so well in the dense ones. That's roughly the same. 
There's one version that does dense and point jointly that works better, but this is a complicated architecture. Um, and yeah, the sparse cons currently dominated all. This is actually already a bit of an old version. I didn't pull the very recent numbers. You can have a look at the benchmark. You can see where we are roughly, um, but still very open research direction. So this is currently on semantic segmentation. And then you can also look at the other uh, things like um, uh, semantic instance segmentation and so on. Okay, um, I'm very excited about this area. This is also something I hope uh, some of you do in the projects, um, but also of course later if you're interested in research direction, this is something that we're always looking uh, for people uh, yeah, to, to, to have with us. So this is actually the last lecture right now um, with the content um, from the lectures. Um, I'm sorry that we were a little bit late. We're all working on the NURBS deadline right now, uh, which is this week. Um, of course, have fun with the project. I think this is a really unique opportunity for everyone. Um, think about your research opportunities, right? Think about all the cool things you can, you can do. Uh, we try to make this course relatively, at uh, the lectures, relatively research-oriented. So we talked a lot about research papers. A lot of the details, of course, we couldn't cover in all the lecture slides, and you have to look at the papers itself. Uh, we try to give you a bunch of references. I also appended a bunch of references to this slide deck. Um, yeah, and I hope um, I hope I'm gonna see or we're gonna see some some really cool results in the project. So um, yeah, see you there and see you in the presentations. Um, take care, stay safe and healthy.